Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. to praise God in his kingdom. Moved by the spirit, one who lives in love, lives in God. And God lives in him. What a wonderful thing is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, good evening, everybody. I, thank you. I, if I look a little droopy, it's because I got caught in a terrible storm. I mean, it was raining hard. So I'm all wet. Well, not kind of dried <laughs> off. And the wrinkles I hide by sitting on them, so you don't, <laughs> you're not going to see those. We just need to reach the world. People are starving for spirituality. They're starving for God. They're starving for truth. And we do this together, you and all of us here. All of you out there, we're doing this for Jesus, for the Trinity, for Our Lady, to spread the good news. And no matter how terrible things are on television, we're there, in between. Some pretty bad stuff sometimes. But we want you to be able to turn that dial and find something good for your soul that you need, maybe your neighbor needs. That death experience I had gave me a lot of light. I felt sorry today when that airplane crashed, you know, one of these fast airplanes that go twice the speed of sound. Boy, that's fast. Never made it. Over a hundred and some people got on that plane thinking they were going to go on a big cruise. That's why they were, I think, going to New York or someplace to get on this cruise ship. See, never for a moment did they think they would make it hardly off the ground. It's that fast. See, we have to be everywhere because people die and people are lonely and people are suffering and people have all kinds of problems. We need to be there with the church. We need to be there with Jesus and Mary and and tell you wonderful things and educate you in the faith, see? And, and we want to remember all these people uh, and their families and your prayers because death is so fast. That's one thing I was aware of. It's so fast and, and there's no backing up, see? You, you can't go before God and and say, well, wait a minute, Lord, I uh, just want you to understand a few things. It, it doesn't work that way. You're, you're there, period. And there's nothing you can do except wait for judgment. He knows what we did and what we didn't do. So it's necessary that this network keep going, 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 so that we can reach to people, all nations, that's what the, I think it's, uh, I didn't intend to find this, and I probably won't. Well, here it is, anyway. It says, I saw another angel flying high overhead. This is St. John, the Revelations. Sent to announce the good news of eternity to all who live upon the earth. Isn't that awesome? Every nation, every race, 
every language and every tribe. And that's what this network is doing around the world to every nation, every language, every tribe, everybody from the jungles, wherever they are, to, to the deserts, to the highest mountain. The word of the church, the word of God, the beautiful truths of the church fall. And when the word falls anywhere, it is always fruitful because it's God's word. And the church has her faults and failings, always has had them and always will probably, but she is the church. She is a mother. She's our mother. And we're obliged as her children to spread to her good news, the news of Jesus, of his goodness, his life, his, his sufferings, his resurrection. That's our duty, everybody. We do it one way, you do it another way. So this network is an obligation we all have to keep it going. Okay? Now, we're going to talk tonight. I think we are. I don't always end the way I start. You know? There is a passage in 1 Corinthians that's very, very beautiful. And it says, this is chapter 6. It said, your body your body, you know, is the temple oh, of the Holy Spirit. You know that? You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're walking around carrying God like a monstrance. If you've been to the shrine in Hansville, you see this beautiful, beautiful monstrance. And, and it's almost eight feet tall. But it carries Jesus, see? Well, so do you. You're in a state of grace. You carry Jesus around. Wherever you go, he goes. So that's what we have to remember. And all these people that died so sudden. Now they have families that are grieving. And we wonder if they knew, you know, if they had time. They had time to, to even know what was going on, see. And their families didn't know either. Why don't we just say a prayer for all of them? You think that'd be a good idea, okay? Lord Jesus, for all those who have died recently in air crashes, automobile wrecks, all those who died sudden, Lord, please, Give them some time before they die. Just give them time to say, I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't know. I'm sorry for all my sins, and I want to go to heaven. Just give them that little time that they need to change quickly before you come before them. And so we just pray for their families to sudden deaths are always so hard. So I just ask Our Lady to bestow upon them the graces they need from Jesus that will allow them to accept this cross with resignation and union with God. We ask that in his holy name. Amen. Well, now we're going to go back to the temple that you are. See, that's why our dear Lord has asked us to do some things like not to judge. Hmm? Not to judge. Not to put motives on other people's, uh, the things they do. We don't know why people do things they do. You don't even know why you do things you do. Why do you have to get mad every time somebody honks a horn behind you? Why are you insulted over that? He thinks you're s slow. Or the red light's on, you're talking to so there are green lights on for a minute, and you're still there sitting there talking, chit chatty. Well, he's going to blow his horn. He's in a hurry. He's got to go. And you're sitting there. 
Mm. Well, it's, he's going to blow his horn. Don't get mad. Your husband's retired. He follows you around from room to room. <laughs> What else is he going to do? You can only cut the grass so many times. <laughs> you can only take a walk so many times. I mean, the poor guy has waited his whole life to retire. <laughs> and what are you doing? Are you following me again? <laughs> well, I don't have anything else to do. Hmm. Why don't you cut the grass? I did yesterday. Oh, well, clean the garage out. I did that this morning. Oh, take a walk. I did that this morning, too. Now you're stuck, you see? So he follows you in one room, and you follow him in the next room. But why you get mad? He's there. He's made a living for you. He's loved you. That's okay. Tell him to take a nap. <laughs> but see, we do get angry about a lot of little things that if we could think that Jesus lives in me, the whole Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live in me. It's hard to... You know, we're so full of faults and weaknesses, and we make wonderful resolutions. But we don't follow them. I always say, make one resolution and follow it. You'd be better off at making 10 or 15. You know you're not going to follow them. But see, in our heart, we get a little jealous. What there to be jealous of? So and so bought a new car. It's going to be a piece of junk in five years. <laughs> Why are you jealous of a piece of junk? Every car is a piece of junk. Put in nice. I, a friend of mine uh, had a tiny little accident, but the fender or something came off the, the what do you call that thing that covers the the the, the, the tire, huh? The bumper or whatever it is. But when I looked at it, it was nothing but little hard things crawling out of it. It was plastic. I mean, it was, wasn't even steel, it was plastic. I, I could have hit it with my shoe and bumped it in. <laughs> I said, how much you pay for this car? He said, you don't want to know. I said, sure, don't look at that, that thing over there. It's just all stuff hanging out of it. And, and we work hard, and I think that's fine. I'm not against new cars. But we, we can't put your heart in a new car. Okay, it can't be on your mind. It can't be so oh, important that if your son wrecks it, you're going to have a breakdown. See, everything is passing. Everything is passing. And I'm surprised it's going to be August next week, isn't it? It looks like yesterday was Christmas. It looks like we just buried Sister Rayfield, and it's August. It's gone. Choo, choo, choo. I remember one time I was on a train going to Wisconsin. Never rode in a train before. I was fascinated. A couple brought me there, and they had a little compartment for me and one for them. And and I I just liked to sit in the in the little thing there, and and I would just watch outside. We went through Iowa, which was awesomely beautiful with wheat. I think it was Iowa. I know I didn't see any potatoes. That's Idaho, isn't it? <laughs> Must have been Iowa. So, I mean, and the, the, the wheat, oh, it was high, really high. And it was fascinating, fascinating, because as I went, uh, this is ice water. <laughs> And as we went by, the wheat from the, the speed of the train and the wind would go this way. Oh, you see oh, acres and acres of wheat going this way. Here's where I got my love for farmers. They do a great job. 
They don't get much thanked and they don't get a lot of money, but they do a great job. But that reminded me of time. Time, it goes just like that, you know. Mm -hmm. One, one Christmas, the sisters did me a favor by buying me an electric clock. Well, I don't mind electric clocks, it's just that it had a second hand on it. They go, all night. Not like it stopped somewhere, you know, it didn't stop. It went, can't you shut up a little bit? Then I thought, well, I better meditate on this because that's my life was going. It's a real meditation. I gave the clock away, though. I didn't like to tick tick all night, you know. <laughs> but you see, we have to really use our mind and heart sometimes that we're being put here by God for a purpose. See, it says here. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, right? Since you received him from God. That's what happened when you're baptized. Now, this is a really sentence that makes you head swim. It says, you are not your own property. Oh, wow. You thought you belonged to you, didn't you? Mm-mm. Hmm? No, you don't. You are not your own property. You have been bought and paid for. Mm. Bought and paid for. Why? He said, that's why you should use your body for the glory of God. All you in pornography, all you kids having affairs here, there, and everywhere, Bad, bad. You're taking a body that belonged to Jesus, belonged to God, and you're using it in a bad way. So you can't do that. Next time you pass a Catholic church, you better go to confession. Jesus came, he suffered, and he died for you. That's how you were bought and paid for. You were bought and paid for by Jesus himself in redemption. And you can't go around doing the things you do. Because you push the Spirit and the Trinity out of your heart. What you do is you say, I don't want you in here. I want to have a good time. But you're not having a good time. Look at yourself in the mirror, all you that get drunk every night. You ever look at yourself? No, you can't. You don't have the courage. You look terrible. You look like you've been out all night. Is that where you want to be? Is that what you want to look like? Do you want your neighbor to have to look at you like that? Why do you want to misuse your body? Why do you want to misuse anything God has given you for evil? All of you that listen to that satanic music, you're putting yourself in danger. You're not using your body for the reason God gave it to you. You're misusing it. We have a gift from God, and we have to accept that gift freely. And we, but I can't do what I want to do. You're driving a car, go through a red light one day and see what happens to you. You can't go through a red light. You say, well, I, I, I don't like greed. Oh, tough. You don't like greed. But you're going to go on green, and you're going to stop on red. Or you end up in the caboose. And that's not the end of a train either. <laughs> so you can't do those things, see? And so if God expects you and I to be holy, then you got to do what's right before God. You can't say it isn't. Now, how do I how do I do that? Do not let your love be a pretense. What is that? Make believe. <laughs> I hate to say this, but women are sometimes good at that. They'll say, oh, hello, darling. How are you? 
And you turn around and she says, isn't that a horrible hat she's got? <laughs> I mean, her taste has to be in her shoes. <laughs> and now you would do that? Yeah, we do that. Politicians do it all the time. <laughs> Elect me and I will give you the world. <laughs> you don't have the money, buddy. Or the brains. Or you wouldn't make these promises that you can't keep. That's a pretense. See? It's also called hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is sometimes mixed up with virtue. Virtue is when I want to explode and I don't because I love Jesus and I want to be like him. That's virtue, it makes you holy. Hypocrisy is different. It pretends to be nice in order to do someone harm. People who embezzle and people who steal and leave their partner bankrupt, see, they pretend to be nice. Nobody knows they're stealing money. But that's hypocrisy. You acted real nice, and all of a sudden the money's gone, the poor man's responsible, and he's broke. That's hypocrisy. Bad. And so our Lord is telling us now, don't do that. Prefer good to evil. Well, do we? I don't know how anyone can watch the program as you watch sometime on television and, and you say you're good. They're terrible, awful. They insult your intelligence. You see, they don't love you or they wouldn't give you garbage. They wouldn't be there to, to fill your kids' minds with violence, murder, sex, everything that's not right. Well, that isn't love. They don't love you at all. There's no love for the masses on TV. Because all of these things do you harm. Or they do your kids harm. And see, then what? See, where are you going? So our dear Lord is telling us here, Prefer good to evil. Love each other as much as brothers should. Oh, that sounds nice, doesn't it? Hmm? Well, in Italian families, we love each other. We just like to yell at each other. That's <laughs> all I mean. When Italians, they don't speak. They holler. <laughs> we went to a big dinner one time, Sister... One of my sisters, Sister Manuel, it was a good Italian family. Spaghetti was awesome. And so the one over here would say, hey, had that spaghetti. Why do you want to hog it up or something? I've been waiting here five minutes. She was horrified. She's got, oh, God. Yeah. What are they talking about? Where's the beans, Mom? They're in the oven. Well, where are they here? Go and get them, then you'll have them. Hmm. That's Italian. I mean, you can't get excited over things like that because that's how they speak. They're not yelling yet. They're just talking. <laughs> Nobody's mad. You going to eat all that roast? Yeah. You can't. Now pass it over. See? Well, sisters used to say, may I have the rose, please? Please. What is this? Please. Please. Go get it. Are you a cripple? <laughs> What's the matter with you? That's Italian. See? It isn't we haven't learned manners. It's just the way we talk. That's all. But she didn't eat anything, poor kid. You know, she... She thought we were going to break out into a fist fight or something. <laughs> I ate two platters of that stuff. You know? I thought while they're arguing on who passes what, I would eat it. <laughs> I was in the middle. So I took it as it went from here to there, and then I took some more when it went from there to here. 
And so I had a good time. I mean, I just thought, keep on, brothers, because I'm eating here, and I'm going to eat all I can. <laughs> but you see, you have to understand people, and our dear Lord is saying that. We have to love each other like brothers would. Why? Well, because we're made to his image, and he lives in us. And we have to have profound respect for each other. Hmm. It used to be, you know, when I had crutches, I'll never forget the time I tried to go one of these, these doors that go around. <laughs> they don't make those anymore, I don't think. Um, but I was trying to get in there where a bunch of kids decided I wasn't. <laughs> uh, and I have to admit, I had some words I never said. <laughs> I... I I couldn't reach them. They kept going around and around. <laughs> but I stood there and prayed for them because I thought, that's not right. See, they've lost the sense of dignity of other people, especially somebody with crutches and braces. You'd think you would let them go and take their time, and no. And so finally, some six-footer came along and put his hand on it. And boy, those, bed, those kids ran fast as they could run. And he said, go ahead. I appreciated that. He was acting like my brother would, if I had one. These little things that we have forgotten over the last 30, 40 years, young people getting up in a bus for an old person to sit down, you don't see that. Opening a door for someone, those are little things. But they, it says, I respect your dignity as my brother. Everyone here, he's not talking about color, creed, religion, whether they're pagans or believers. He says, everyone is my brother. And that's a sign of Jesus in that person, because he's thinking more of, him, of you than he is himself. But see, the more violence we look at and the more of this stuff that you're fed on TV, you have no idea what it means to be loving, kind, respectful. You don't have any idea. All these soap operas, my God, when they don't know what other sin they can commit, they kill him off. <laughs> the, next, the next version is, oh, he died in an accident. Now we can start the whole mess over again. <laughs> you see, but that's what you're interested in. <sighs> if you died after listening to one of those soap operas, I don't know what you're going to say. You ain't going to say anything, really. You see, we're not using our heads. We're just letting the world pass us by, as terrible as it can be. <clears throat> these are, when you do these things, you see, it's work for the Lord. Work for the Lord with untiring effort. Well, <laughs> you're hardly able to do that. You know, if you have Mass on Sunday and Holy Day comes, we all got to rest. You know, you've had a hard Sunday. We can't have another Holy Day coming up. Goodness sakes, you know, you <sighs> got to take care of yourself. Mm, I don't know. It says untiring effort. You're supposed to wear yourself out if you belong to Jesus. You're supposed to. That's our duty. And it says here, and with great earnestness of spirit. And today, sometimes I'm afraid we're even afraid to talk about Jesus. I don't know. Do you don't want to be called a fanatic? Go ahead. Let him call you a fanatic. What is a fanatic? Someone who loves Jesus, I'm one. I'm one. You don't want to go by the world. See, these are the things that God is asking us to do. And he says, if you have hope, this is Romans, 
This will make you cheerful. <laughs> Are you cheerful? No, you're not. Oh, why not? Because you lost hope. I would suppose if someone were to ask me, what's the one theological virtue that the world knows most? I would say hope. That's why you have too many suicides. That's why people go headlong more and more and more into the, some of the grossest sins, because they lost hope. They, they don't believe in the other life. They don't believe in heaven, don't believe in hell. Then what are you going to do with your life? You see, there's nothing there to discipline you. And, and so they, they're not cheerful. Do not give up if trials come. Keep on praying. And what a beautiful sentence. If you want to look this up, it's 12th chapter of Romans 9 to 13. See, he says, if, you, if you're feeling bad, you have a lot of trials, keep on praying. Some people get mad at God. That's a terrible thing to do. What are you mad at him for? You're probably responsible for what you did. And if it's an unjust thing that happened to you, it happened to him. See, the theological virtues you get at baptism, faith, hope, and love. And they pertain to God. I have faith that he exists, and he is the author of this book. And the church he gave me is the church that he left me with sacraments and spiritualities and umpteen graces that's, that's at my, my desire. Whatever my desire is in grace, I can get that because I want what he wants. And, and see, that's what's so important. Hope. To say, well, the church is in bad shape. Well, it's getting better. I think it is. The world's in bad shape, yep, but it's not getting better. But it's going to, you know, our dear Lord's going to take care of it. You don't need to worry about that. In his time, in his time, he will take care. He will take care. And that's why we have to have hope. If any of the saints are in need, now, they, everybody was Christian in those, in those days was a saint. You say, whoa, why? Because they knew the probability of them thrown, being thrown to the lines was very good. Every pope for the first 300 years was martyred. Everyone. Boy, can you imagine some of them when they were elected pope? Oh, God. <laughs> But he didn't say that. They were happy about it. He said, oh, praise God. One of the great, the worst days that Nero had, the emperor of Rome, was the day, the first time they sent Christians into an arena to be eaten up by a lion. Well, they came out singing. He couldn't take it couldn't take it. It made him very nervous. What are they singing about? They knew it was coming. They were earnest. They were zealous. They were full of God. And they're saying the whole time. See? It didn't change. It didn't take that example. But these people knew who they were dying for, for the one who died for them. And so we, we all have our problems. We all have our disappointments. We've all had tragedies in our lifetime. We all have aches and pains. Then you take medication, then the medication makes you sick. And then you go back to another one and you take more pills and they make you sick. And then you go back and they gave you more pills. So what's the conclusion? Well, you're either going to take what you had 
or something else. It, it's just a, a vicious circle in our lives, but that's what's sanctifying. I want you all to be saints. It's not hard. Take what comes to you in the present moment with hope. It's okay. It's all going to be waiting for you up there. All of it. And then he says, if they need you, they, you must share with them. <laughs> I just talked about that, didn't I? I didn't plan it this way. It just happened to be. You must share with them. And then he says something that's really nice, really nice. He says, make hospitality your special care. Hospitality. We see Aunt Minnie coming. You lock the door ahead of time. <laughs> hey, Mom, why you lock the door? Aunt Minnie's coming. Oh, can we go somewhere else? They, they don't call that hospitality. <laughs> A beggar comes to the door, and what do you give him? You've been waiting to get rid of that stale bread. So you give him two slices of stale bread with some bologna that's had its time. <laughs> well, you don't want to throw it out, so you give it to him. Not hospitality. Somebody comes to you, a dear friend. Okay. But you've heard about her organ recital a hundred times. She starts with her headaches, goes to her gallbladder, goes to her kidneys, goes to her esophagus, goes to her abdomen, and ends up with an ingrown toenail. <laughs> and you've heard it all a hundred times. So what do you do? Well, if she calls, you're not home. You can tell by the ring. <laughs> there she is again. Oh, Mom, do we have to hear that? Yeah. But see, hospitality goes right out the window. Hmm. It does. See, because we, we read these things and we think they're very nice. And they are. But they're not written for nothing. They're not written to take up space. They're written for you and I to take it serious. Very serious. Hospitality is supposed to be one of the Franciscan Order's special virtues. Because hospitality, you know, the Catholic of Siena had a beggar come at her door. He was wretched looking and full of sores. And he was hungry and cold. Well, at first look, she was kind of nauseated, but then she said, no, 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 that's not the right thing to do. So she goes and gets some hot soup and a, and a sandwich, and, and she puts a blanket on him. And when she put the blanket on, his whole face changed, and there was Jesus. And she was so shocked when he disappeared. Isn't that awesome, huh? That's awesome. So we don't know when we're taking care of Jesus. And we always take care of Jesus. If you go and visit someone in a convalescent home, I'll never forget the woman I went to see. Well, I went to see, I wanted to give him a talk. And this woman was crying. So I went over and sat with her. And I said, what's the matter? She said, I have nine children. I said, oh, that's a nice big family. And she looked at me with the saddest eyes. She said, I thought it was. And I said, what's the matter? She said, I've been here two years and not one has come to see me. Nine children and not one went to see her. See what we do? And, and, and we don't realize what we do. We may think, well, we're paying for her. She's in a nice home and that's enough. It's never enough. 
They need, she needs for you to tell them, Mom, I love you. Are you okay? Do you feel all right? Is this place good for you? Can I get you something? Little thing. They don't ask for big things. She bore nine children, took care of them, fed them, educated them. And you're saying that not one of nine has the time to visit a mother? I can't buy that. And I don't think God does either. Mm -mm. So we see the things we do are, are not, this is not in that book, in this book. The things you do are not in here. And here he says, even now, even if somebody curses you, oh, it says, bless those who persecute you. Never curse them. Wow. Hmm. That's kind of hard, don't you think? Huh? Well, I don't think I like that. That's what he's asking us to do. See, that's what you call virtue. See, that's virtue. That means that my human nature wants to curse somebody or persecute you. But the Lord said, no, you can't do that. You must bless them. See, we know what he wants. We just have a hard time doing it, don't we? See, somebody does something really nasty. You say, Lord, bless them. They don't know what they're doing. It makes you feel good. Do you realize that? You can get a lot of ulcers hating your neighbor. I don't think it's worth it because your neighbor that you hate isn't, doesn't have an ulcer. He's having a good time. He's eating caviar while you're eating crackers. That doesn't make any sense to me. Even on that human level, it doesn't make sense. Because God has asked us Rejoice with those who rejoice and be sad with those who are sad. You know, I was surprised one time when my mother died. She was a nun. Sister Mary David lived in our monastery. And I cried for two days. And this woman saw me crying at the funeral and she said, I don't understand. I said, why you cry when you have such faith? I said, I don't think my faith has anything to do with it. I miss my mother. I don't think it has anything to do with faith. You're supposed to cry when somebody you love dies. I mean, that's, that's, you know, I, I wouldn't go on and have a big banquet. I couldn't even afford that. But I think you're supposed to grieve. You're supposed to feel bad. And you've got to wait the time until you, till time not only erases it and doesn't even erase it, but at least you can handle it. <coughs> See, we, sometimes we're so human that we get cold. And then sometimes we're so human, we finally begin to love. And that's, what, that's what's being said here, you know. Treat everyone with equal, ooh, equal kindness. Oh, that's hard to do, isn't it? Especially when Aunt Minnie comes along with her organ recital, you know. And don't send your son out to tell a fib. Is your mother in? No. Where is she? I don't know. She told me not to tell you she's home. <laughs> I think that's great, you know? That poor kid, he couldn't, he couldn't lie. He didn't know he was told to lie. He just told, my mother told me to tell you she's not home. Do not allow yourself to become self-satisfied. Oh, we do that sometimes, don't we, huh? You're satisfied with where you are in the spiritual life. You're satisfied with your prayer life. Well, if we're doing well, fine. But if we're not doing well, be honest. And say, Lord, give me the grace to pray well. Give me the grace to keep close to you every day. 
Every day of my life, let me be close to you. We have a call. Hello? Hi, Mother Hi. Angelica. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Texas. Good. What's your, what's your question? My question is if you could give some pointers on how to live divine providence each day. Oh, yeah. We forgot about divine providence, haven't we, huh? Everything that's been done here is on divine providence. It's hard to explain. Hard to explain. The five families who paid for that awesome shrine and, and monastery, it's hard to believe, but it is five families. See? And that's divine providence. In your daily life, you have work to do. You have to trust our dear Lord that he will give you the strength and the energy to do your work. You trust him going to work. You trust his providence daily in keeping your children safe, in being able to make a living, in being able to bear with pain that cannot be changed, in bearing with sudden deaths. That's all divine providence. Does he allow it? Well, obviously he allows it. He may not, it may not be his ordaining will, but if it happens, it's his permitting will. And do we understand that when these kind of sudden things come upon us? If we can say, look, you know, we worry a lot about the future. Everybody does. You say, well, I have money in the bank. But we don't know it's going to happen to it, do we? So divine providence comes in and you trust him. That no matter what happens, he'll take care of you. And you all have that. Nobody in this room can't say or could say that they have not been taken care of by the Lord. All these sudden things that come to you, good things. Time, a lot of people write me letters after they've been here and said, I just didn't have the money. And all of a sudden it was there, that divine providence. This whole network is by divine providence. I have to depend on God to inspire you to keep it going. I, what do I do? I can't go out and make enough money. Who can make two million a month? Tell me. I don't even know anybody who has two million a month. So what do I do? I depend upon all of you, but that's divine providence. We're all a part of divine providence. That inspires us, it inspires all of you to give, to keep it going. If he stops doing that, it won't go. See? That's divine providence. See? I had, uh, what do you call one of these things on your heel that you get? I don't know what you call them. Anyway, they're painful. And I can hardly walk on it. So I went to the doctor and he put a shot of cortisone in there and I thought, oh, there we go. But I thought, well, thank you, Lord. It helped about three days that it came back. So I tried, I went to the drugstore and I tried every kind of art support I could get. Some are too short, some are too small, some are too heavy, some too hard, some too soft. I said, Lord, please, what can I do, Lord? I, yeah, I've tried everything. And he inspires little sister Gabriel. She said, Mother, you remember the first pair of shoes you bought when you were healed? I said, yeah. I bet if you put them on, you'd be okay. I said, by golly. So I went and got them. Here they are, got them on. <laughs> and it worked. It had a wonderful art support that I had forgotten. And so I don't even have any pain walking. That's divine providence. I tried everything myself and perfectly flopped. Big zero. And then he inspired somebody else to come along and say, try this. That's divine providence. So 
So all of the, everything that happens to you or for you or with you all day long is a part of God's goodness to you because he loves you. Now, I thanked it to Gabriel, but I went to chapel and thanked him. But thank you, Lord. At least I can walk in a show tonight. And it didn't hurt. The, all of these things. If you have a really good meal, you say, well, my mom cooked it. Well, I don't care who cooked it. God gave her the talent, provided the food that you liked. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's just a thousand things every day. We have a call. Hello? Mother Angelica. Yeah. This is Calvin. Okay. How, how are you? I'm doing good. I wanted to thank you for the picture and book you sent me for my graduation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I've got a question for you. All right. I was picked on a lot during my middle school and elementary school days. Yeah. And I wanted to know what would you have done to stop it if that was you? Uh, are you asking me how I would respond to a bully? You are. Mm, I thought you were. You really want to know what I would do? I'd be very calm, cool, and collected and kick him the best place I know. <laughs> I'd pick it out, too. <laughs> well, I don't think that's the answer I should have given you. But bullies are different. You know, kids fight. They don't mean anything. They're cheerful five minutes after they have a squabble. Bullies are cowards. That's what a bully is. They can be all kind of bullies from every state in life. But a bully is a coward who gets joy overriding other people. But you stand tall and say, hey, look, one more of those, buddy. I want to knock your head against that wall. <laughs> Don't do it, please. <laughs> And doesn't say Mother Angelica said I could do that. <laughs> I'm not saying what you could do. But if you stand up to a bully, he will back off for the simple reason he's a bully. He, he pretends to be strong among other people. But he always picks on the weak. He never, never picks on the strong. You get a six foot five man come along, he goes away. See? Now, if you weighed maybe 200 pounds and you had big muscles, he wouldn't bother you. He's afraid. But remember, a bully has to be corrected somehow. You don't have to be violent like I just said. That's, behind, that's before I knew Jesus. <laughs> But you have, all kidding aside, you have to have a Christian response. You have to stand tall. One of the problems we have today, the people don't stand for Jesus, they don't stand for anything. They're afraid. They're afraid. They're afraid of imaginary consequences. See? And that happens in religious life, it happens in career life, it happens everywhere. They're afraid. And the bully knows you're afraid. He keeps on stronger and stronger and stronger. You need to stand tall and say no to a lot of things and say yes to some things that must be done, that must be said. So always remember, number one, a bully is a coward. Number two, he only acts in a crowd. Number three, he's more afraid than you are. Stand tall. Ask our dear Lord to help you. Just stand tall. And sometimes that's all you need. That's all you need. So if that's left its mark on you, just ask our dear Lord to forgive these people and to make them understand 
that being a bully is beginning your way down. It is not a virtue. It is not something God wills for you. Well, would you believe he's uh, crossing his arms here? It's not a holy thing he's doing. He's telling me, I got 30 seconds. I love you. And I know God loves you. And this network needs you very much at this time. So we'll see you tomorrow night with a wonderful guest. God bless you.